Welcome everyone. Wow, what a big crowd. That's really amazing. So I hope you're in the right session here. I have to give an disclaimer before we get started. So first of all, this session on, well, retrospective is kind of the topic. It's not about any games or activities. Uh, yeah, right. So, uh, so this is what you can find in a lot of books out there, also on the web and so on. And I just felt that what's missing very often is to look at the skills and, and capabilities of a facilitator. And not so much on what you do, but how you do it. So, and this is a se session is about that. So, in case you are looking for games, that's not it. That's the one disclaimer. I have another disclaimer, which is a bit weird as well, which, because, well, talking about retrospectives and also things, how you do stuff and so on. First of all, this session here is not a retrospective. So don't tell me later on I didn't eat my own dog's food and so on. So I know that I don't because it's not a retrospective and it's a talk, right? And it's more on the meta level on what's happening in retrospectives. And I hope, and that's why I have this other meetings here as well, I hope that you can also make use of it for other meetings other than retrospectives. The main focus is on retrospectives. Okay, enough about this, I guess. Well, and of course I have, for the people who have been in my other session yesterday, they know this probably already. So, all of my books here, there's a little bit of a marketing campaign. However, I didn't bring enough books, it seems. So, I have three left on the retrospectives for organizational change, which I brought with me. And um, the, the cost of delay, it's, that's gone. So, but in case you're interested, after the talk, just talk to me. Okay, I think we can get started, right? Let's see, so that's my agenda. I first wanna look at something that you might find a little bit boring, which is I wanna look at preparation and design of a retrospective. Then I hope that you find really a lot of value in facilitator and also in specific problems that I've experienced myself and I also have seen others kind of experiencing and then thinking about, yeah, what to do about this and wrapping up. Okay, for the preparation and design, we're getting started with a room. So I wouldn't have liked this room, actually. Starting with uh, how many people are in that room, it would be much too small to do anything decent. So the size of the room often makes a big difference. And then also in terms of the location, where the room really is. So the, the typical question, do we want to do this on-site or off-site? Do we even run the meeting, the retrospective in the room we are working? I advise not to, but I also know that sometimes that's the only option you are having, and so you, are just, you better use that option than not running a retrospective. So I, I know that too, but I would work on finding a room that's more adequate than your usual working room. Then um, another thing about the room is um, what I find important. First of all, can I use the walls and put stuff on the wall? If I can't, which can be true as well, then I have to find a way how to make things transparent and visualize them. So. For example, one thing that I really like a lot, and I, I have no idea if you get them here in, in Singapore or wherever home is for you. Um, we have statically preloaded flip charts. So I see some people nodding, so some of you might know them. So you just put them on the wall and you don't need any tape, sticky, anything, and so they won't leave any track on the wall. And that's something that you can use all over the place. But I also like uh, about them too is that you can use them as a whiteboard, so wipe out stuff that you have written on it and pack them uh, together and carry on with you. Um, maybe even reuse them. Then um, another thing in terms of location, I prefer to have a room, which is good here, where the furniture is movable. Sometimes I've experienced and, and had the retrospective in a room where the furniture was fixed to the floor. It was, yeah, right, you 
have probably seen that too. It's attached. It's much harder. However, if you know about it in advance, you can deal with this. So, in, in, in case you can um, ex, uh, make explicit what's good for you, what kind of room, then say so. Um, what else do we need? Well, a facilitator, of course. Then uh, there is also the question, which is a typical one, is an internal or an external facilitator? Well, this depends also on the needs of the team or the group you are facilitating here. And remember, external could also be just external to that group. Then I believe the last question in terms of like this whole organizational preparation is who will be in that meeting? or in the retrospective? Well, one answer is it's the team. Another answer is maybe it's like one level up management as well, because sometimes you need the backing from the management in order to really make some decisions and put them into practice. And if we forget them, we will not get the money, for example, for doing so. So that can be important at times. And another thing that can be important at times is to have the customer with you in the retrospective. Because the customer brings a different perspective on what has happened. And what we typically do is that from time to time we have the customer with us. So, and just for, as a thought, who is there really? Okay, then, so that was organizational preparation. And I have to look at my watch. Um, how long does it go till half past three? Um, then methodology, I always have these difficult words, it seems, in all of my time. Methodological, is that right? I don't know. Method, methodical, methodical. Okay. Oh my gosh. Preparation, sorry. <laughs> Should have really rehearsed that over and over. So um, I, I have done it really in this. I know you can't read it, at least not uh, at the half of the room, but I have done uh, methodical preparation in a very proper way, which is kind of what I have here, how I present it. Very often it's just a sketch, and it's just, it's not really proper like that. However, what I always do is think about the timing. So how long should something take? What's the order of it? What's the, the activity thing I want to do? What exactly is happening there? So it's activity and the method. Then I might have some comments and the actors. So what are the people who are involved with that? So maybe it's more me, maybe it's the whole crew, maybe it's somebody specifically doing something here. So it's uh, the, the actors who are involved in that activity or method I'm using, and then what kind of material is needed. So that's the, the key thing about like the method or the layout or the design of how you want to run that meeting. Again, which this is also helpful in any kind of meeting, not only in a retrospective. And then the probably most important thing about this is to come up with a plan B. Because, well, I always prepare, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm really, really German. I did, didn't say so in advance, but I am German, and so I really prepare myself and do the things in a kind of a strict way. But I never stick to it because things are happening, and so I, I change, and I'm not following this as a, as a plan that needs to be followed, but it helps me to... Um, kind of anticipate the meeting in advance. And this is helpful for really coming up with good results. So I really uh, suggest you to focus also on a methodical preparation. Now I can't speak that word. Ha, huh, getting there. Okay. Then the meeting agenda, and I assume for the retrospective you all have seen that. So this is what Esther Derby and Diana Larson came up with in the very famous book, which I absolutely recommend, and I assume most of you know it, have it, and whatever. So the meeting agenda for a retrospective is exactly that. So first we set the stage, then we gather data, gain insights, decide what to do, and they have a closing. The interesting thing to me, and I just realized I didn't really say much about myself, 
um, I recently went through a master's program which was on business coaching and change management. And there I learned, which is interesting because I've been in that business for a long time, business coaching and change management. I, it occurred to me the first time that facilitation is really at the core of that, of change and of coaching. And probably this is also why my interest in, that, in, in facilitation is so big. However, um, why I'm saying this is because of in that master's studies, what I learned as well, well, there's like a classical layout for any kind of workshop. And there, the agenda is like that. You have an introduction, then you collect topics. You select the topics and work on them. Then you have a action planning and closing. It's exactly the same, just different wording than what we have here in the retrospective, which also means a retrospective is nothing else than any other kind of workshop, if you will. And um, I'm saying this not for maybe downplaying retrospectives. I'm saying that this opens up a lot of material for you because you can look up in any book which is dealing around like facilitating workshops or any kinds of meetings and just make that translation when they talk about collecting topics well that's gather data right so it's really you can make use of a lot of stuff that's out there so that's uh, something that I found helpful so I'm not really going into details here I think that um, I have only one one point the setting the stage which I learn some things which I found helpful. Well, first of all, coming up with a goal for that meeting, for that retrospective, which is probably not something pretty new. However, what might be new to you, what I always do is for that goal, I define an acceptance test with the group I'm working with saying, okay, when would this meeting, this retrospective be a success for you? When would we pass that? So what would mark that acceptance test for that meeting? And that's a different maybe attitude to framing what, where you are heading. Um, yeah, that's the one thing. The other thing, and that might be something you do anyway, I don't know, is um, at the start, and this would be a too big crowd of doing that, is I always want to go once round. So everyone has said something at the very start. I, I feel like this is opening up something so that people are not afraid so much in speaking, speaking up in front of the group once they have been saying something. And the, whatever they say, it's, well, on the one hand, it could be important, but it must not be necessarily important. Often one thing that I like to do is, for example, collecting the ideas for the acceptance test. So when would, for you, that retrospect retrospective be successful, and when would you think it would be a failure? And so like, this is a question we can go around, and so we collect that. So that could be a good idea. Another thing uh, which shouldn't be forgotten, and uh, to be honest, at times I forget, is at the beginning to also clarify any administrative concerns, whatever it is. How much time do we have available? Of? So anything that's outside of the content of what we are focusing on. I guess, oh yeah, that's almost it. Um, dealing with time, that's not showing the real time. It's <laughs> that's whatever time, I don't know. Actually, that was PowerPoint offering me that when I looked for time. So you can take that. And I was surprised when I saw that it was running. Oh, it keeps running. That's cool. OK, so in terms of time, so one thing which is pretty well known is using time boxes for whatever you are doing. However, also there, you have to be flexible because there is, and think of your methodical preparation. Maybe you thought about, well, we need 10 minutes for that. And then you figure people are really in discussion. And it probably would be a bad idea to stop here. And although you said it's a time box, but maybe there's more time needed, and so maybe it's good. Another thing is also in retrospective using a lean coffee approach. So just for specific things, putting like short times aside and only like dipping into it. And uh, maybe last advice in terms of time, which is on the one hand obvious, and again, also I myself forget about this at times, is just ask. 
ask, how much time do you think you will need? Is maybe two more minutes okay? Or maybe you need more, maybe less? How far are you done? And so being more flexible with that. So time boxes are a good start, but they're not serving every purpose. And also, you always need some flexibility if your focus is to get results. You don't want to just uh, ensure that the time is passing by, right? OK, that's um, for the organizational, um, for the design and preparation. Then um, the facilitator, so me, you. First of all, the definition of it. And again, that's what I got from this master's study. So what, what the official definition is that the facilitator is an objective supporter servant of the group. It, he, he, she is a midwife for the content, meaning not involved in creating the content, but helping the content to be created, right? Um, the problem here is, well, who is the facilitator? Maybe you are part of the group. Maybe you're part of the team. And then this gets harder and harder. And so you may have to be very clear in what your current role is. Are you at the moment really acting as a facilitator, or do you want to make a contribution? Sometimes it's helpful just to move from one side to the other and say, OK, now I'm a participant. And so my perspective on this is blah, blah, blah. Right? So if you are in this um, dual role. Um, so the, the thing is really helping the group, the team, coming up with something. And this is by what you have done in your methodical preparation, so providing a method for that meeting, and also by visualizing what's going on, and by ensuring everyone has a voice. So it's not only the, the talkative people here who are contributing. I come back to this just in a, I don't know, like two slides or something. Okay, so that's the definition of the facilitator. Um, a model that I found really helpful is something that's called theme-centered interaction. Maybe it looks a little bit old. It's because it is old. So it's not that I made it old. <laughs> and uh, the theme-centered interaction says, if you are in a meeting, then there are always at least three things at play. So the one is I. So how am I here in this meeting? And I means, well, it could mean the facilitator, but basically mainly it means the people who are part of that group you are facilitating. Then, so in, in terms of people, the individuals, really, that's the I. So it's really one and the other one, right? And then we have the we, which is what's happening with the whole group. So speaking of group dynamics, we all probably have heard about that. And then um, the third thing is the it, which is the subject, the topic at hand, which is the goal we defined beforehand, right? And so these three things, they are embedded. That's what theme-centered interaction says. They are embedded in the globe. So saying in the environment, for example, in the company or part of that project or whatever. So there, is, there are some constraints that are defined, and they are just there. Now the thing is, as a facilitator, your task is to uh, provide a balance between the individual, the group, and the topic at hand. And now that you think, um, or you might think, oh, that's cool. So now I figured how to have that balance. TCI says, well, the idea is not to keep the balance, but to tip from one to the other. Because if you completely balance that out, nothing will happen. Because you're stuck, basically. So you want to focus on the individual, then you want to focus more on the group dynamics, then you want to focus more on the topic. So just ensuring, and again, this influences your methodical preparation, ensuring that all of these three have their um, maybe own rights and enough time, and that yeah, you, you just um, ensure that they are all there. Um, oh yeah, there's one more, one more really important thing. 
uh, of TCI. TCI says, uh, so it comes with a few rules, and one of the rules is uh, disturbances take pre preference. And what it, what it means is, um, I guess most of you have seen that experience, that you are in a meeting as a facilitator or participant, it doesn't really matter, and somebody knocks at the door, the, um, whatever manager boss comes in and says like, oh, I need you for a second, and please go ahead and keep on with your meeting. And so walking up to one guy and then picking him or talking to him, and well, you could think like, okay, so I keep going on with that meeting, but you can't. It's a disturbance that's there and it has to be acknowledged. And it's not acknowledging like appreciating it, that's not what's meant, but it's just there and, and you can't ignore it. That's the point. So you can't ignore any kind of disturbance that's there. And uh, disturbance most often they come from outside, so kind of yeah, as I ex the described it, or also um, when you think of the, the keynote, it, it worked out fine, but I felt like, oh, not much more thunder and lightning, and I can't hear anything anymore, right? We had the thunderstorm and lightning like every morning for the keynote. It was like right timing. Um, it's, it's a disturbance that's there, just. And sometimes you also have disturbances from the inside, meaning that people are very passionate about something because they see their point and they really have to say it. And if you kind of kill that, well, it's still there. It's like the elephant in the room. And um, I believe the next thing, yeah, that fits very nicely to that, which is um, the way, well, Again, a, a difficult word. Let's see if I can pronounce it. Constructivistic. Oh, that was good. Constructivistic. Well then, perspective means that we all have our own truth, and we see the world from our own view and angle, and we can't assume that somebody else like you have the same view on the world that I have. And even if we are working together every day, it's just like, well, we are individuals. And there is a model that I find helpful, which I want to share, which is called Four Truths. It comes from uh, Human Systems Dynamics. So there's a website as well, hsdinstitute.org. There are a lot of great um, models and methods there. And the, the way it works or what it does is it says whatever we are doing, there are always four truths around us. And the first truth is probably the most obvious one, which is a subjective truth. And the example that I brought with me here today is if we think about noise, because I just thought that probably translates to a lot of cultures. So there are always people who are like different. Maybe I'm at the beach and there's really nobody and I still feel like a little bit disturbed because of the waves rolling into the shore, right? Because I'm, I can't stand noise, not at all. And then there are other people, they go to a rock concert and they think, oh, this is really not loud enough for a rock band. What is that? Right? So we, we have different perceptions here. Of course, also depending on the context, that's true as well. But um, still, so I, I'm not sure if you have seen that. I see that a lot when, when we talk and we do pair programming. There are always some people who say, well, this is disturbing me. And, and I, I don't, I'm one of my my own office where it's all quiet and all of that. So it's a, yeah, well, noise is uh, seen differently. So that was the subjective um, truth. Then we have the objective truth, which is something you can measure. Well, in terms of noise, you can still measure it, but what's uh, kind of something you can deal with, that's probably another topic. However, the official measures say that um, what people can stand during the day is uh, 40 decibel and during night it's 30. And actually I'm not sure if this is international or it's a European number or whatever. So there are numbers out there which kind of say this is what's, what's possible. So um, objective truth is always something you can measure and go against that. 
And then we have on the top something that's called normative truths. That's the truths we decide in our team that this is how we can get along with. For example, it's like this. We, we talk to each other, but in a more, uh, maybe more silent voice and, and not so loud so that the people at the other desk can still understand each other and also talk to each other so that we have some agreement there. Okay, these were three truths. Subjective, objective, normative, and now it's getting complex, <laughs> which is the complex truth, that's the question mark, saying, well, all of those three truths are always there, no matter what we decide and agree upon, so it could mean that one of them takes precedence no matter what we decided. Maybe I feel today this is really so noisy, and so even this, what we agreed upon, like the silent uh, kind of quietly talking to each other, is too loud for me. Maybe I partied yesterday. Hmm. Okay, so that's the four truths. The way I'm using it, if we get really get into a heated discussion, for example, in a retrospective, so one thing is for me to know about this. That's one thing that I find helpful. Another thing that I find helpful is I am presenting that model to the group when we have that heated discussion, which typically is good enough for people being more aware of that's how it is. It's not that only my truth is the right one, but there are just people with different perspectives and therefore they have their own truths. So showing that model often helps uh, creating more sensibility here. Okay, then um, participants in the focus. Uh, uh, that's the one thing that I talked about a little bit beforehand, um, which is thinking about how to involve or engage the participants in your meeting and one thing is, well, sometimes we just collect the pluses and minuses or and so on, which I think is not a retrospective, by the way. However, what's important in order to ensure that not always the same people are talking is, first of all, differentiate the participation um, style, which is like do stuff which is focusing on the individual only, and this goes also back to the TCI, right, theme-centered interaction. So individual reflection like that old lady is doing here. Then another thing is you have a pairing thing, where also it's more likely that really the two people are talking and it's not only one is talking, and then you might have subgroups or the whole group doing something. And interchange between those formats is often helpful. Another thing, um, interchange between orally and written uh, writing style, or maybe you want to draw something. That's why I also picked that lady, because she's standing in front of that picture. So just different styles often also help that different people are participating. And uh, a last, maybe the simplest but most effective one is if you go round, I, I said this already in the opening round, that everyone says something, and you can use this, of course, also during the retrospective if you do something and just ask everyone to make a contribution. Then if you do that, please ensure that per person, per round, you are only allowed to say one thing. Because if you don't do that, Maybe you have seen that as well. And you said, sit in the end of that round, everything has been said. And you feel like, oh, I can't contribute. <laughs> and just because the first two guys, they were just throwing out like all the five points everyone had on his mind. And on the other hand, by allowing only this one after the other and just one thing also helps that everyone kind of feels of, oh, we are all thinking along the same lines. And otherwise, you are so, or at least I'm, I'm so frustrated that I can't say anything and everything has been said that I kind of back up from the whole thing. So that's a, probably a, a really simple tip, but helps a lot. Um, ah, facilitator and the pressure. Um, you will see in a, in a second why I have that picture here, which is... If you feel like, oh, I, I really don't know what to do here now. It's a really weird situation and not sure how to, to act now as, or how to facilitate here. First step is to take a deep breath. 
Just a whoosh, right? Oh yeah, that's cool. The second step is, and that's what that picture I thought is for, um, change your physical location. So change your perspective and change your perspective really physically. This often makes a whole difference. We talk often about that changing perspectives, but really changing the place you are standing or sitting or whatever makes often a big difference. Um, and then observe. So that's the third thing. So take a deep breath, change your perspective, and then observe what's going on. Sometimes if it's really, if we feel we are really stuck here, I ask the same thing to all the participants. So also for all the participants, one of the most important thing probably here is, well, maybe the deep breath, but really the change of the location where they are sitting. This, again, opens up a lot of things. And I thought this is like a really different perspective on <laughs> yeah, what's going on. Sometimes what you could also use, and that's maybe the only game I'm having here, well, game activity is the Disney method. Um, but you could use here, so asking people to step into the roles Disney has used, like the creative dream of what would happen if, so making it a really positive thing. And then you have the realistic planner saying like, well, but if we want to do this, we really would need that. And then you have the constructive critic who would then say, okay, but that's what's, what's really going on here. So really taking kind of a role play in order to get, to get out of your stuck situation. I think we are fine. Then we are coming to the specific problems. And I've seen on the wall people um, referencing already Virginia Satir. Oh, and I just realized I think I thought of doing them one after the other. Uh, and I tried to do this. So on top, you see the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then the acceptance. That's from a lady called Kubler-Ross. And um, it, both of them, so the one below is Virginia Satir. The one on the top, which isn't as pretty, um, is from Kubler-Ross. And they both refer to what's going on if you go through a change. And let's take the one on the top first. And I want to uh, maybe explain that with an example. So when, well, you all have seen that. There's an update of a software. Well, it fits well to Goiko's uh, talk before. And for example, what I often struggle with, a new version of PowerPoint. I have a colleague who really did go through those stages just by example. So first of all, there was this update of so new PowerPoint version now, and of course he was completely ignoring it. So denying that it exists, and he had his PC, had this old version, everything fine. However, there came the time where he had to get a new PC. And the new one only came with this new version of PowerPoint, right? So there wasn't anything about denying anymore. He was really angry, kind of, yeah, complaining about it all the time. Then the next thing was the bargaining. What he did was he found a plugin. A plugin, if he, after installing it, the new PowerPoint just supposed to be the old one. Cool. So that's that thing. However, then there comes a time where, first of all, there's the one or the other thing that's not working probably, or he gets uh, uh, slides from somebody else who uses something that's not there in the old version, and therefore things are not really the way they should. So it's kind of that depression going on. And finally, he finds out, like, oh, maybe the new version can do stuff I was looking for for a long time, and so coming into acceptance. So that's the, the Kubler-Ross model. Actually, coming from grief after losing a person, that's how she was developing it. But it's really, if you, you are real, realistic, true for all kinds of change. Then Virginia Satir kind of says a, a similar thing. Well, you are on a status quo, maybe this PowerPoint usage. Then the foreign element, the new version, you drop into chaos. You have your ups and downs. Maybe you think, oh, it's, maybe it's not too bad. But then there's another thing where you don't find the menu anymore. And you're like, oh, it's all screwed up. And you just up and down. Till you get to a transforming idea. 
um, where you think, oh, maybe, yeah, it is really practical, integration and practice, and you come to the new status quo. So that's something we all go through. But if we are now in a retrospective where we are talking a lot about things we want to change or things we plan to have changed and nothing happened, the thing is that every individual goes through these curves, some very quickly in one circumstance and for another circumstance, maybe the same person, it takes a long time because that's really true for all of us. Now, the, the big problem is if... Um, I'm, I'm just kind of all through that and I'm in the integration and practice because I have gone through this with my mind for a while, then maybe somebody else in the group hears, hears that for the first time and this is the moment, and I guess you all have heard that too, like if some people say, oh, we are not starting that discussion again. We have gone through that before. And the point is, that person who wants to go through that discussion again is probably at a different stage as you are. And so for that person, it's probably needed. Maybe one more thing about change I heard, I have to speed up here. Uh, is, um, well, first of all, I learned that you have to have a cat in every slide deck in order that people like it. Um, so um, the other thing is we are talking about resistance to change and cats are just animals who are not following on. They just do their stuff, right? So this is one of the things. On the other hand, that I said, well, you have to have them in every slide deck because they are very attractive to people, it seems. The highest click rate on YouTube. <laughs> well, what, I, what I'm heading at is that if you think somebody is resistant to change if you take a, um, an approach on attitude, which is um, something that's created in the complexity and chaos theory, is they are saying there is no such thing as resistance to change, but there is always an attractor that seems to be more attractive than that change you want to kind of implementing. So kind of like people are looking for the cats YouTube and not for another YouTube because I think the cat is more attractive, right? So what you need to find out is what is the attractor, why somebody is resistant to that change? What keeps that person away from that change? What is that attractive thing? And once you know about that, you can either try to implement or uh, yeah, implement that attraction also to that changing thing, or maybe you can work with that person in order to kind of find another attractor in the change. So thinking about resistance more as something like an attractor is also something that I, at least helps for me when yeah, I deal with difficult situations. Oh my gosh, yeah, uh, problem seems unsolvable. We, we all have seen that. What I find really helpful here, here is what's called solution-focused approach, which is, um, well, we have that problem. We don't really know how to solve that, and let's just assume we have that here. So today is the last day of the conference. You do whatever you do, go home, or whatever. let's assume we are living all in Singapore. So we are going home, having dinner with our family, maybe doing some sports activity, uh, watch TV or so and go to bed. The next morning we are getting up and that problem is solved. It's gone. However, nobody told you that's gone. So overnight a miracle has happened, which you don't know what it was, but the problem is gone. And so the question is, how do you know that the problem is gone? Who else would know it? What marks that difference? And um, yeah, who else would, mark, uh, would recognize that difference? So this, again, is something that opens up something if you are in a stuck situation. So just thinking very positively about a situation and imagine that a miracle has happened. So that's uh, something I, that I really like to use, which is different than looking at, for example, asking five times why, where you dig into the problem deeper and deeper. It's just the opposite here, right? You just imagine it's gone. Okay, so now what's the situation? And then if you know what the situation is, you can plan, plan for actions how to get there, which is often easier. 
Um, I really would like to show this as well, which is, and then probably we finish. The problem seems not solvable by the team. So there, there I have a, a few things. So one thing is sometimes it's part of the team's culture. So they always come up in the retrospective with things they can't change. It's always some people around them. So people around them who just screw things up and that's why they can't do whatever they can't do. So that's, that's the first question. Uh, another question is that you figure out who's really in control here and maybe you invite that person. As I said at the beginning, maybe the manager should be here so you really can kind of make a difference here. However, the thing that I really found the most powerful is the thing that's called paradox intervention. It's actually something that's even pronounceable, um, surprisingly. Um, paradox intervention, what it does is if you're saying, okay, we have that problem, how can we make that problem worse? And this is your question. Your question is not how to solve it. Your question is to the whole group, how to make that problem worse? How can we make it really so bad that it's terrible bad? And remember, we said at the beginning, it's a situation where the team really feels they are not in control. It's people around them who created that. However, I've never, never, ever experienced that people were not coming up with a way how to make that situation worse. They always come up with the how making the situation worse. And they have great fun in doing so. It's always like, oh, yeah, and then we could do blah, 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 and so it's, it's cool. However, now the trick is, then once you, you know what you can do to make it worse, you also know you can do something about that situation. You also can make it better because you can influence the situation, really. And it could be just by, like, how you act and react to what's going on, but often it's much more than that, and you only figure out by thinking about this, like how to make it worse. And then you know how to make it better and improve it. Okay, that's um, very good. And I'm coming to the end, because I heard I'm running out of time, or have been running out of time. So facilitation wants to ensure that everyone has a voice that you have to buy in from everyone by being inclusive and share, um, changing between like, remember that individuals pairing, then the, like a subgroup or the whole group, so creating shared understanding, ensuring the different perspectives, sometimes really physically this is needed in order to change a perspective and to open up and it should support learning. And only uh, quickly, so these are some of the references. So there are more and more retrospective books out here. However, remember, you can look up any kind of workshop, facilitation book. They also fit to retrospectives. And um, a thank you to Katya and Jana for the pictures. And this is it. And we have two more minutes, I think. Thank you. Two more minutes for questions. I probably can take two or so. Yeah. So how do you make a team member who's not uh, speaking up or sharing issues? So how can I make a team member who is not speaking up to be contributing to the retrospective? So one of the things is really doing like individual things. Um, so individual reflections. And also doing stuff in writing often helps, but I'm not sure is this where you're getting it. Yeah, not speaking up is what you said. So not basing everything you do on speaking. That's the, the main thing. And um, what I find often helpful is um, doing a, I don't remember how it's called. I'm sure somebody knows it here in the room. So you start with an individual reflection, then you pair up or triple up, and then you have like maybe five or six people together before you have like the whole group, how big ever then your group is. Which means whatever an individual has contributed will be um, kind of forwarded to the next bigger group. And that person might not speak up once it's presented to the whole group, but with the pairing, and especially if you say it's written up, then it's still there. Yeah. Um, maybe one more, yeah. How do you facilitate or or uh, Ah, that's a really difficult question. So how do I facilitate a retrospectives for not 
non-collocated teams, which is actually, a, I would think, a completely new topic, which takes another, I don't know, time. Um, it depends very, very much what your setting is. For example, if you are basically on two locations, you have like four people here and three people there, then it's very helpful to have a facilitator in, at each side and ensure that uh, whatever is happening is synchronized every once in a while and you spread up again. However, if you are like completely dispersed, so you, everyone sits at a different side, then everything is virtual. And um, the, I, it, and regarding the time, I think my best advice is that you need to have more time for preparation. So you do more prep work for that. And for example, appreciate inquiry questions in advance, help there, which is like, but what do you think is really important and good and helpful in our situation? So coming up with some questions where people are answering and you collecting, presenting it there, and then also kind of, yeah, splitting out again. So I, at least I think often uh, virtual meetings, they train a lot of energy. But um, again, it's a really a uh, complete new topic, right? And I don't know, we are out of time as well. One last question, okay. Very good. Can you say some experience uh, when working with uh, no no problem teams? No what teams? No problem. It means the team think that they have no problems. Ah, they have no problems. <laughs> ah, right. Um, that that's a good point. Yeah, um, which is. Uh, <laughs> so one thing that I found helpful there is that I asked. Do I have that book here, the Norm Curse original? Uh, I switch it off. Um, retrospective book. Nothing's working here. Okay. Um, so the first book on retrospectives uh, from Norm Curse, where he has a thing that's called definition of success. So he's more talking about end of project retrospectives, but you can also use that end of sprint retrospective. And um, the thing is, you say. Uh, you ask, has this last sprint been a success? And we define this success as um, we would do everything exactly the same way as we did in the past sprint. And this often is enough that people say like, well, yeah, but this maybe not. So that's sometimes a trigger for coming up with something else. Um, Another thing that you could do is maybe use a retrospective and do a value stream analysis and see how you create value with the team. And by coming up with this value stream, you, I bet you find points where, well, there are waiting times, handing, hand over, uh, people mis did misunderstand each other and, and therefore not really moving forward. So using something like this, which is focusing on the results that have been created and how they've been created, um, probably would help as well. I just think about the way I'm talking about it. Probably it's, it's not so much different than the definition of success, actually. Looking at the value stream, it's just from a different angle. But maybe when I sleep over it, I think it's not the, not, <laughs> not really the same. Yeah. OK. OK, thank you very much. As I said, I had three more books if you are interested. And